Theater. William Lucas and Josephine Tewson in Post of Honor, the last of three plays from R.F. Delderfield's A Horseman Riding By. The Shallow for the State, in the Sorrel Valley, County of Devon, five minutes to midnight, September 1st, 1929. <laughs> other times, other rhythms. And up at Squire Craddock's house, the brassiest, rowdiest party I ever remember. All the old house remembers. Notwithstanding two jubilees, a mafficking, two coronations, and the return of Squire Craddock from the dead at the end of the war to end wars. The coming of age party for the Squire's twins, locally known as the pair. And by Jiminy, they were a pair. Everybody here, just about everybody. The youngsters full of cocktails, the old stagers taking sips of the toast glasses, but sticking to beer and home-brewed cider. And here's Squire himself, about to make one of his rare speeches, and his wife and daughters blushing for him. Your MC, Simon. Quieten them down a bit, for heaven's sake. speech-making on the program. No more than a toast. Charge your glasses, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Governor, just a few words. Oh, here comes Stevie. <laughs> and the archdeacon's daughter looking as though she wished the floor would open. <laughs> Go on, Paul, get it over and keep it short. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Gentlemen, um, not squires coming of age. <laughs> uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't know what's appropriate on these occasions. I uh, suppose I should do, for this isn't the first celebration we've had at Shalomet. But it seems to me by far the most bibulous. Right, tonight, tonight, the two young gentlemen who are our hosts cease to be my responsibility. And that certainly calls for a drink all round. So I ask you to be upstanding and drink a toast to their physical health and my own and their mother's mental tranquility. <laughs> it wasn't at all bad, Paul. Now they want the telly home crocodile, Governor. Oh. Oh, that awful stamping all over the house. Oh, they'll wreck the place, 200 of them. It's traditional, so Wiz tells me. Wiz tell you, indeed. She's 16 and she'll be in bed. Oh, Martha, don't be so stuffy. Oh, go ahead, it's only once in a lifetime, and I took the precaution of taking everything breakable up to the big bedroom and locking the door. Now, keep an eye on them, Simon. I'll do my best, but that's some assignment, Governor. Okay, there. Oh, now, line up, one behind the other. John, here's our chance to slip away. Has Maureen got a coat? No, it's as mild as midsummer, I say. Well, that's that. <laughs> it's as well you're staying at our place tonight. <laughs> Some of the youngsters will be at it until daybreak. Not only the youngsters. Henry Pitts and Smut Potter are three parts tiddly. I'll say that for some of the Shallowfoot originals. Oh. They've got stamina. <laughs> it's more than I have, old girl. I'm for bed. Seventy-six and you involved me in that melee. Oh, don't be taken in by old John's tut tutting over seeing the girl's legs. He enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> so did Paul, that part of it. <laughs> you bet I did, and why not? Uh, you want to go in now? Oh, no. It's a wonderful night. 
Let's cool off out here. I leave the door of the lodge ajar for you. Good night, Paul. Clear. Good night, John. Sleep well. I'll be lucky. Thank God your boys thought fireworks were too old for you. <laughs> nice. Oh, well. What do you make of them all, Paul? Of the youngsters? To be perfectly honest, it depends on how I feel. Right now, on a couple of pints of champagne, fairly hopeful. <laughs> and you? They'll do. I like one thing about them. Their honesty. There are plenty of hard-faced ones up there, but not a potential hypocrite among them. Fun, noise, dancing, living for the moment. That's their creed. Our brood included. Except old Simon. Ah, yes. Simon. That's his mother's legacy. Well, don't talk as if you disapprove. All his life, you've leaned over backwards to avoid discrimination as regards Simon. Of course I have. Wasn't having anyone in the valley pinning the wicked stepmother label on me. Does he ever talk about Grace at all? Never. You remembered her when you were watching him doing the honors for the pair tonight? Oh, not specially. Why did you? I did the moment I came out here. You can smell the scent of that rose garden, the one she made. Mm. Stop raking embers, woman, and come within touching distance. Why should the youngsters have all the fun, eh? <laughs> I like this uh, skimpy dress you're wearing. It gives me ideas. <laughs> <laughs> you're a young 50, Paul. <laughs> you're a pretty spry 46. And a far more interesting shape than those flat-chested fillies up there. <laughs> Will bosoms ever become fashionable again? Well, if they don't, I'm dated for good. Come on. Let's turn in and leave them to it. They've got all their troubles ahead of them. Hello there. Out here all on your own? I'm waiting for my sister, Esther Evelyn. I drove the Ford over to pick her up. You're not Rachel. Yes, Simon. Rachel Evely that was. Oh, but good Lord, I'm terribly sorry. How was it you weren't invited? <laughs> I'm not local anymore. I haven't lived in the valley since my husband was killed. You might just remember him. Keith Halsey. He was the valley country but it didn't stop him getting blown to pieces helping the wounded in Flanders. I remember Keith very well. How could you? You were only a kid. Oh, Ikey wrote to me about him. Ikey Palfrey, the stable boy Governor adopted. He and Keith were great friends, and he often mentioned him. Ikey wrote to me every week from France, and I kept all his letters. I was 14 when they told me he'd gone west. I thought then... Oh, hell, it's not a night for sob stuff, is it? What were you going to say, Simon? Only that I've always tried to be Ike's kind of person and never succeeded. He would have laughed secretly at that hedonism and high spirits out there tonight, but he would have tolerated it. And you don't? Not really. Why not? There's so much waiting to be tackled. Our generation won't sort things out with a saxophone, will they? <laughs> you really are the odd one out, aren't you? What do you do now you've left Varsity? You don't farm, do you? No, farming's not for me. Have you decided what is? One day I'd like to stand for Parliament. Not an agricultural seat, somewhere up north or in South Wales, where they really need a champion, and a bloody-minded one at that. You know those kind of places? I should do. I've pigged it in one of them since the armistice. I never heard that. Why should you? Farming isn't for you, you say. Well, rural rustication wasn't for me either. The real waste of the war wasn't the blood spilt, it was the brains. Keith Horsey had the best brain around here, and I thought I owed it to him to try and compensate. So, I got a grant and took a degree in economics at Leeds University. They encouraged the morally earnest in the North. You went into politics? I tried to, but I didn't get far. Why? I ran headlong into the sex barriers your mother, Grace Lovell, spent her life storming. 
There's still air, you know, in politics, as in most other spheres. But the professions are open to women with degrees? In theory. And providing a woman is prepared to turn up in a tight skirt and leave all the real decisions to the men. Look here. I'm down for a few days. The pair want my help handling the governor over a madcap idea they've got. Will you let me buy you lunch in the mitre at Paxtonbury tomorrow? Me? You. Is it a date? Around 12.30? It's a date. Now, go on and tell Esther I'm waiting. Oh, sure. Harming wasn't for Simon, and it seems it wasn't for any of the young Craddocks. Politics and doorstep conversions for him, and for the squire's twins, the pair as they were called, a world far removed from all of us down along. There's big money in it, Gov. And Uncle Franz is right behind us. That's why he's here. Franz Zornov? What, here? That old rascal? I didn't tell you, Paul. I thought the twins had better tackle you but first. you're in on this, Claire. No, Governor, leave Mother out of it. This is something Stevie, me and Uncle Franz dreamed up between us. Uncle Franz has agreed to sign us on as junior partners. We're to take over the Birmingham Yard next month. Birmingham Yard? You mean Scrapyard? What else? Uncle Franz is the king of scrap, isn't he? Yes, yes, he is. And when I was your age, he did his damnedest to make me the crown prince, but I declined the honour. If they want to paddle their own canoes round a scrapyard, they might as well do it under the supervision of someone who's made several fortunes out of junk. That's a very practical way of expressing it, my Damn dear. it, Franz. You've been crouching there with your ear to the keyhole. Nonsense. I heard your roar in indignation on the first landing and came down to divert your wrath in the right direction. You couldn't talk me into inheriting a scrapyard in 1902, so you Shanghai two of my sons in 1929. Well, I'm not getting any younger. Well, what the devil's your age got to do with it? We all know you're rolling in money. Now, go easy, Gov. Oh, let him say what he likes. I'm far too old to take offense. Then you and Paul talk it over in private. Run along. You too, Andy. I'll gong when lunch is on the table. Well, I don't know. It's our future. Yeah. From scrap back to scrap in one generation. Have the grace to be thankful. I waited until they were out of earshot before I reminded you of all the money from scrap iron that's been poured into this valley since the Boer War. I'm hanged if I know where you, your tenants, would be without it. Queer street, I shouldn't wonder. Well, you agree with them that farming is a dead duck? As a matter of fact, I don't. It'll bob up again. It always does. But it wouldn't if it was left to them. Oh, damn it, Franz. I can understand the eldest boy chucking it, but the pair have got farming on both sides of the family. Their grandfather is the fifth Derwent to farm haiku. Their generation and yours are not two, but ten generations apart. Blame the war if you like, but don't blame them. They don't know a thing about scrap metal. They'll only lose your money. My boy, will you stop regarding the scrapyard as a habitat of a man in a leather apron driving a donkey cart? Did you ever see me actually handle a piece of old iron? They'll do what I tell them. I hope you realize they can't add up a column of figures and that their scrawl on the few occasions they put pen to paper is illegible. We are a sizable enterprise, my boy. We employ clerks, storemen, and bookkeepers. Look, they'll go with or without my blessing, and you know it. Why did you come all this way, Franz? They've got to make a new mole, Paul, and they won't do it growing artichokes. Let them go, and Simon too, if he wants to, but do it with good grace. Let all three find out what life's about up there among the grime and the brick stacks. Either they'll adjust and be a credit to you, or they'll come home with their tails between their legs. In which case, you might find your neo-human dynasty after all. You're a plausible old rascal, Franz. I sometimes wonder how I got away from you. <laughs> All right, they're uh, your responsibility. Good luck to them and good luck to you, and it's my belief you're the one who's going to need it. However, uh, since you're in such a pontifical mood, give me some commercial advice. One of my tenants has been pestering me to sell him the freehold for over a year now. You trust him? Uh -huh. Oh, yes, yes, of course. He's Claire's brother, Hugh Derwent, over at Haikoum. Then sell. Sell tomorrow and retrench all round if you have time. It's as bad as that. We are heading into the worst economic blizzard of our lifetime. Why don't you retrench instead of signing on a couple of amateurs to open a Birmingham yard? Because the scrap trade is the vulture of the flock, and we can smell carrion at extreme range. Sell that farm, 
and count yourself fortunate. You're quite resolved on this, Paul. 300 acres lopped off the estate in the east. I wouldn't sell the freehold to a stranger, John. You know my policy better than that, but damn it. Hi Coombe is a family holding. The man is my brother-in-law. Yeah. What does Claire think? Oh, she says this has to be my decision, and I see her point. Yeah. And old Edward Derwent? Well, what's it got to do with him now that he's retired? Hugh Derwent, he's a hard man to fathom. Sometimes I think he's dull. Other times deep. Still, if you mean to contract, you might as well do it inside the clan, and heaven knows you can use the capital. And so it was done. The first bastion to fall in 28 years, and quickly forgotten. There were so many things to attend to. Eleanor Codsell, for instance, wanting to give up Periwinkle, and her son Mark, not interested in keeping it on. Mark Codsell wants to come here as groom and huntsman, Claire, and suggests splitting up Periwinkle between Four Winds and Hermitage. Well, is that such a bad idea? You sold High Coombe readily enough. Why are you hesitating over this? Mm, because I've got a soft spot for Periwinkle. It emerged from the first independent decision I ever took the year I came here. It was a 70-acre holding hemmed in by Moore. And if Mark turns his back on it, it'll go back to the moor. Cut your losses. Split it between four winds and hermitage and put Eleanor out of her misery. She's in the kitchen. She has something special to ask you. Mm. Come in, Eleanor. For heaven's sake, don't look so abject. What widow in her senses wouldn't be flattered to have this kind of compliment paid her. He's come all the way from Germany after 13 years well, to ask you. Willie Mayer, the one who worked on your farm as a POW? Ah, he showed up again a month or so back. He's a well bred squire and a widower. You've made up your mind to marry him, Eleanor? I won't take no for an answer. Well, then what the devil have I got to do with it? I mean, so long as your son Mark is for it, your daughters are off your hands, and you turn 45. 42. And don't nobody tell him different. <laughs> she wants you to give her away, Paul. Uh, what, me? Well, wouldn't your brother Francis. Oh, get on, we. Francis haven't had a colour in Tyron in years. Besides, it's. Didn't that. To make it right with the valley. And being a German and my well being killed fighting against him. Unanswerable logic. Excuse me, there's the telephone. Well, that uh, doesn't make any difference to how you feel about Willie Mayer? No, it don't. Maybe it should, but it don't. He didn't want to fight. No more than poor old Will did. And it's a long ways off now, all that old fuss. Will you do it, Squire? Will you stand for me at the church? Yes. Yes, I'll do it, Eleanor, if you huh? tell me one thing, and no hedging now. That time in the war when Willie was working on your farm and Gloria Pitts got so steamed up about what she thought was going <laughs> on over there now, was there a particle of truth to it? Well, let's put it this way. Huh? It hadn't got so far as Gloria reckoned. But us was making good progress. <laughs> Don't he ever let on, will he? <laughs> Jolly good luck to you both. Uh, and Mark can start here in Jiver's place as soon as he likes. It's Dr. Maureen. Paul, she says get down to the lodge as quickly as you can. What, John? He's taken a bad turn. She's sending him to hospital. I'll go down right away. John Rod. Squire will miss him cruel, won't he? More than he'd miss any one of us, Eleanor. He's been a centerpiece here since the very beginning of it all. John, it's Paul. <clears throat> Sit with him. I'll watch out for the ambulance. Should be here any minute. I, I tried to tell her to leave me be, boy. If I've got to go, I'd like to go here. Been best part of my life for close on 50 years. Now she knows what she's doing. I should have liked to have left you on a crest instead of floundering in a trough, lad. We've <laughs> survived worse, John. <laughs> ah, that's true. You're a, a damn sight tougher than you look. Bore bullet in the knee, lump of hunt shrapnel in your head. 
and this white elephant on your back all these years. Uh, not so much of the white elephant, John. I could have done without the bullet and the shrapnel, but otherwise it's been fun. Uh, Particularly with you as Longstock. <laughs> I wouldn't have cared to tackle it alone, but uh, I've told you that. Time's enough. Yes. Yes. Well, keep at it, a boy. Uh. He's gone. Well, thank God you were with him. That would have meant a lot to him, Paul. I didn't tell Claire. I knew it was a matter of hours. You would have hated dying outside the valley, Maureen. Can I uh, get you a drink? Get yourself one as well. Tell you something, Paul. He was a hell of a time finding his way. He didn't start living until the Lovells left here and you took over. You had a lot to do with it? We had a good marriage. But with John, the valley was always top priority. You resented that? Never once. I had enough to do as the only doctor about here. A marriage ought to be based on a man's job. You and Claire have proved that. Will you be wanting this house in due course for a replacement? Replace, old John? <laughs> oh, I couldn't do that, Maureen. You belong here, and John taught me everything I know. Oh, I couldn't replace either of you. Wouldn't care to try. He's done what? Your son, Hugh, sold High Coombe to Sidney Codsell's jerry-building outfit? The top acreage is going for bungalows. A new road is to be driven as far as Coombe Bay, and the cliff fields are being leased to that caravan outfit in Winmouth. Edward, is it done, or are they thinking of doing it? Done. Well, I made it my business to check with Codsell's foreman. There are excavators up there as soon as the ground dries, and even that's not the whole of it. They say he's got three times what he paid you a year ago. You'll uh, take a drink, Edward. Uh, no, 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 thank you, Paul. Paul, you you believe I I had no hand in it? You you believe I, I, I'd have seen him dead first, don't you? Yes, I believe that. Claire's taken it hard. She said she talked you into selling back along. Oh, I make my own decisions, Edward. Look, run me as far as the coom and then get off home and keep out of this. Claire's gone there now. And I'm going after her. Hugh? Hugh, it's me, Claire. Be right with you, sis. Squire, where are you? No. Father, then? I'm alone. I came the minute I heard. Ah. Oh, you reckon it'll get round among all the old chatterers at John Rudd's funeral? You didn't go yourself, then? Oh, you had things to do. Generations of litter to be sorted and packed up. Yes. Four generations. It'll have to be left nice and tidy for Codsell's jerry builders, mm. won't it? Now listen, your sis. There's no Is call. that a picture of mother? You can see it is. One that was hung in the big bedroom. <laughs> what That's the one hell we you doing? won't take with you. But I didn't come here to argue about fixtures and fittings. I came to make absolutely sure. Is it just a right of way through here? A strip giving access to Coombe, or is it the lot? The farmhouse and 300 acres Paul sold you at a giveaway price because you were in the family. Isn't a better good for any of you to carry on that way? I done with farming. More I thought, more amazed I reckon I was. Picking up your loan for the rest of my life. Trying to scratch a living out of land nobody gives a damn about anymore. I'm 50 and I've had a belly full of it. <laughs> you don't catch me stopping on till I wear out like... No, I'm an evil over four winds, some of the others round here. How I'll tell you another thing, too. If Paul Craddock had been offered the price I got for it, he'd have grabbed it with both hands. Oh. Well, that isn't so. Hmm? You know it, Hugh. Didn't a particle of use you come in your griping? It's all signed and settled. Yes, I know that. I telephoned Codsell. 
In a way, it was a pleasure. I hadn't spoken to him since he tried to ride me into diddling the government on pit props for the trenches in France. However, I uh, didn't follow Claire over here to gripe, as you put it, but to warn you to get out before you run into your father. When he shows up, it'll be with a shotgun. Um, let's go home, Claire. I don't understand. You're not bitter, are you? Don't you feel this as deeply as father and I? I don't like the idea of seeing High Coombe replaced by a string of bungalows and caravans any more than you do. But I'm not afraid of the Sydney Cotswolds. If someone challenged you, if, if, if someone asked you to state in terms they could understand what you've spent your life doing down here, could you tell them? I think I could. Fighting to preserve a little dignity and beauty and usefulness in one small corner of England. And if that sounds pompous, I don't give a damn, because that's what it's all about as far as I'm concerned. Well, my first job is to brush up on maps. They won't get a blade of grass they aren't entitled to. To brush up on maps... Well, it was time enough. The big one in the office was scored with the musical chairs of the years. But the path showed nothing like this. The head of the coom blotted out. And the growl of concrete mixers all the way down the eastern frontier to the sorrel outfall of Coombe Bay. The woods guarded the north and the say the south. But spring saw another convulsion in the west. Hugh Durban had something there. Norman Evely of Four Winds had worked himself into the ground. Mr. Craddock. Oh, Rachel. Well, your mother didn't tell me you were home. I won't be staying. I turned my back on this place too many years ago. I never really made it up with my father, but you knew that. Yeah, it was also damn silly, that row you had over marrying poor old Keith Horsey. You should have made an effort. Well, one or other of you. Well, it's too late now. He's about finished, isn't he? Yes. He's finished. It's a pity. He would have thought very differently about my second marriage. I'm not so sure about you, though. But you've married again without telling your parents? Not yet. Simon and I were planning to marry next week before he opens his campaign for the Roxton by-election. You and Simon? You didn't put two and two together? Well, he wrote saying you'd crossed paths in the north, but... Uh, the hush-hush nothing... was his idea, not mine, Mr. Craddock. I don't think he was worried about your reactions. Uh, about Claire's, eh? Oh, hang it all, he's 28 and... and... I'm eight years older. Well, that's your affair. But I'd sooner have known. I don't see why I had to be so damn secretive. Maybe he remembered all that fuss at the big house when Ikey married Hazel Potter. Well, that was another world. Who the devil can afford those kind of prejudices now? Besides, you're in Simon's camp, aren't you? We both believe things have got to change. Oh, well, haven't they changed enough? They'll change a lot more yet. What, for the better or worse? People like Simon and me think that's up to us. Do you mind if I'm absolutely honest, Squire? <laughs> it runs in your family. One way and another, I've made a bit of a mess of Simon. Is that what you're going to say? Not entirely. He's got a good mind, good health, and absolute integrity. But they won't get him far without purpose. Your kind of purpose. <laughs> I always assume people like you and Simon thought of my outlook as archaic. I shed most of the prejudice I had in your respect learning about you from Simon. That and the kindness you always shown mother and father and Keith when he was hounded as a CEO. Well, it encourages me to ask a favour. Go on. Help me to be a good wife to him. How can I do that? Don't send him any more money. Huh? I've known whole families that live on less than you allow him every week. And if there's one political animal I can't stand, it's a theorist who preaches socialism when his own belt is let out to the last notch. Will he win this seat he's fighting? Not a hope. But the experience will be valuable. Look, you've been candid. Now it's my turn. Is it a marriage between two people? 
or a couple of guerrilla fighters on the run. No, it began that way. But I think he needs me, and I'm very fond of him. So, you never can tell, can you? No. So good luck to you. And, uh, Rachel, I admire your pluck. Go into your mother now. Hmm? Who wants to see me? Harold Evely, Marion's second boy. The one who did so well in the army. Well, is Marion with him? No, but his wife is. She's a pleasant little body, a Lancashire girl. Well, maybe they're going to offer Marion a home. Uh, ask him in. <gasps> Oh, yes. Uh, come in, both of you. Uh, you. You won't remember me, Mr. Craddock. <laughs> Only as a lad. Just before the armistice, you were in the Shropshires. Oh, I'd forgotten your capacity for detail. Uh, this is Connie, my wife. Uh, Connie, Squire Craddock. Uh, How do you do? Yes, well, we can skip the courtesy title. Uh, will you take Sherry, Mrs. Evely? Uh, oh, we'd, no. uh, we'd sooner get straight to the point, Mr. Craddock. Yes, the future of four women. <clears throat> Harold wants to know if he can take over the lease. Four wins, Lise. But I uh, thought you'd got a good job in a factory up north after you left the army, Harold. Oh, I did have, but, well, the slump happened, and here I am. I thought I was settled for life. Uh, Connie and I were married less than a year before I was axed. Now we're adrift with a couple of kids. Oh, why didn't you come back to the land after the war? There was a place for you. Well, that second pip went to my head. It was a come down to go back to a glass of beer at the Raven after whiskey and splash in the mess. I always was a bit of a show off, remember? But um, you're over 30 now. And I haven't milked a cow or plowed a furrow since I was 17. But you don't forget those things, Mr. Craddock. <laughs> Most of the youngsters around here prefer to. Agriculture is down and out, Harold. It's still more promising than the dole queue. Now, look, I don't want a man who uses four winds as a bolt hole. Oh. We wouldn't do that, Mr. Craddock. You've had experience? Oh, not of farming, but of other kinds of hard work. Lancashire hasn't been a feather bed since the cotton trade was cornered by the Japs and the Indians. The uh, squire's got a point, Con. What four winds needs, now the old man's gone, is a natural farmer. Well, it was worth a try. Now, now, wait a minute. I haven't turned you down, have I? You'll take a chance on us. You see, sir, Con and me talked Mother out of coming up here because we both thought you'd lean over backwards to help her out. We didn't want that, either of us. I can't honestly say I'm longing to walk behind a plough again or that I think raising a crop of kale is mankind's noblest endeavour. But we're in a hell of a spot right now. All I can promise is we'd do our best and we wouldn't walk out the minute something less mucky turned up. I was pig-headed once, but not any longer. We'll drink to that, Harold. Paul Craddock adjusted to the abdication of his sons, but he never quite knew what to make of his daughters, except that they were pretty enough to bring a whole of young men in the house. Mary, 18, dark, and seemingly dutiful. Wiz with her bedroom full of Gymkhana trophies. And young Claire, the prettiest and youngest of them all. An odd trio, you might say, and the only thing they had in common, apart from good looks, was their delight in Rumble Patrick, the wildly improbable product of Ikey Palfrey and Hazel Potter, who started life in a cave and shared Shalliford Nursery with the Craddocks. Rumble Patrick. <laughs> Rumble was proving something of a handful these days. When your uh, headmaster goes on... He rode a motorcycle round the country disguised as an elderly labourer and finished up drinking a pint of cider in the local. This is crazy. Well, it wasn't the pub that worried him so much. It was driving without third-party insurance, sir. Now, don't come that sir business with me. It won't get you anywhere. Damn it, your, your father, Ike, and your grandfather, old Tamer Potter, were a couple of headaches, but you take the biscuit. Why... Why do you have to live in hot water instead of taking an occasional dip in it like everyone else your age? I don't know, really, Governor. Unless it's that sometimes it seems everyone takes everything so seriously and, well, I have to, well, try and even it up a bit, I suppose. Look, everyone is taking a beating just now and we aren't all endowed with your kind of bounce. The point is you've been expelled. What the hell am I to do with you? Well... Well, I like to get out and about for a couple of years. I mean, really out and about, overseas. 
The governor of a pal of mine has a big sheep farm in Queensland. He, he invited me over there to try it for a year when I left school. Oh, was he serious? Well, I, I think he was. If he wasn't, I could always move on. I'd like to have a look at British Columbia as well. There's money in timber out there. He wants to try sheep farming in Australia and then timber felling in Canada. I shall give him his head. He's just like all the others. He hasn't a spark of loyalty for the valley. Don't you believe it. That one would always come back. Besides, there's too much of his mother in him to keep him away indefinitely. Will you promise something, Mary? Will you come here once in a while and... Well... Remember me? Yes, of course. Of course, but... Oh, Rumble, do you have to go? You could cry off even now and still go to an agricultural college and come back and take over home farm sometime. I couldn't. And the governor knows I couldn't. As a matter of fact, it's mainly because of that I'm going. I'm not in the line of succession, Mary. But the twins and Simon haven't the faintest interest in carrying on. Oh, they'll come round to it. They never would if I staked a claim in advance. Simon, he's too unselfish. And the twins would use me as an excuse. You must see that, Mary. He's never really got over the fact that neither one nor other of them wants to take over. I would, and I could. But I'm not his son. Just the byblow of a kid he fished out of a scrapyard. No, moving in that way wouldn't be much in the way of acknowledging what he did for me or my father, would it? Then you're not really keen to go. Keen? Leaving the valley, leaving you. It's the hardest thing I've ever done or ever will do. This... This is where I belong. It's never been any other way with me. Although I don't think I knew that until... Well, until I burn my boats. I love you, Rumble. Love me? You love me? I could never love anyone else. Do you understand that? Just you. Funny thing. I've thought about this many times. I've imagined it, but well, that's as far as it went. I always thought it would have to come from me. And even then it was a kind of fantasy. Oh, coming from you like that makes it that much more wonderful. There's only one thing, though. One important thing. Hmm? It doesn't bind you. I don't want it to spoil things after I've gone. I want it to bind me. <sighs> Will you tell them at home? When I'm ready. Until then, let them guess. It won't be that hard for them. Slumps are as transitory as booms. Things settled down. There was a smell of permanence about the valley the following spring and the spring after that. That was the year of the weddings. Wiz was the first, and it rattled Paul a little. This fellow McShane or McBain or whatever he's called, he said nothing to me, not a word. <laughs> oh, good heavens, Daddy. What year do you think this is? 1066? Put him in the picture, Mother. You've met Ian several times, dear, and his name is McLean. Flight Lieutenant McLean. Now, that's something you'll have to get right. Yeah, there's been so many pimpling young bucks roaring up here in their rackety little cars. But I introduced you to Ian at the Hunter Trials. He isn't the least bit pimply, and he doesn't drive a rackety little car. He was second in the open race at the point to point and hunted every Saturday when he was stationed at Paxton Brick. You and Ian will hit it off, Paul. He's a solemn, dependable young man. Mm. Uh, leave your father to me, Wiz, and ask Ian to dinner tomorrow. Mm. We'll all do our best to impress him. All right. <laughs> I know she's young, Paul, but he's absolutely right for her. She's a bossy little thing, and all those show cups have made her uppity. And he just isn't the kind to stand any nonsense. They want to marry before he's overseas posting. Then she can go out to him in the autumn. It'll have to be quite soon. I'll start writing around straight away. Ah, yes. <laughs> uh, one moment, please. Uh, one moment. Everybody quite still. Uh, would you mind moving aside a little, sir? I want this to feature the cake. Thank you very much. <laughs> Nobody would think you were footing the bill, would they, Governor? <laughs> Have you got a minute while Wiz is busy with the hardware? 
You remember Monica? She was at our 21st. Ah, oh, Archdeacon Dearden's daughter, of course. Uh, and uh, you're looking very charming indeed, if I may say so, Miss Dearden. <laughs> Better get used to Monica, Garden. Mm. We're next in the queue. Oh, what? <laughs> really, Stevie, what a way to tell him. He's trying to say we're to be married in October, Mr. Craddock. Uh, well, God bless my soul, I, did, I didn't even know you were engaged. <laughs> well, I didn't know myself until half an hour ago, but that's Stevie, isn't it? <laughs> Monica looked us up when she was in Brahma a month or so ago. Then we ran into one another today. I thought, what the hell? We might never get around to it. So. <laughs> uh, yes, well, uh, uh, congratulations, um, <laughs> Monica, but... Uh, well, I must say... Oh, there's Andy. A better tell uh, One last picture ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Claire. I can't stop now, Paul. I promised to help with change. She has much time. You've got to stop. Steve has just told me he's going to marry Monica Dearden in October. October, is it? Well, good for her. Well, you, you, you know? I thought it would be in the new year. But damn it, you tell me he only got engaged to her half an hour ago. Oh, yes, formally. But it was in the bag the night of the licensed Vittler's ball. You talk as if you arranged it. Well, I suppose I did, indirectly. Well, I made up my mind it was time the pair settled down, so I dropped the hint, never so casually, that Monica was unofficially engaged to Alderman Gratwick's son. Oh, look, I simply must go. What a time to pick for a family inquest. Women... Well, that woman, you think you know all the answers, and you should after 25 years, but... Uh, great Scott, 25 years, May the 1st, she must have forgotten. Uh, mm. Forgotten? Forgotten we've a silver wedding anniversary coming up. <laughs> Don't be silly, of course I hadn't. I merely shelved thinking about it. <gasps> Oh, oh my feet. Thank goodness the archdeacon's wife will have to cope with the next wedding. What shall it be, our celebration? A trip to Paris? A hey nonny nonny right here? Or dinner at the mitre and home to bed? Hmm? The last suggestion is the only one that appeals to me right now. Hey, don't drop off. Oh. You never finished telling me why you steered Monica Dearden into Stevie's embraces. Well, it was time the pair began to operate independently. All their lives they'd been egging one another on. Bet you can't, bet I can. It was time they grew up. And now it's for Andy to take Stevie's dare, hmm? Anyone special in mind? Oh, I'll think of someone. In the morning. But in the event, she didn't have to. Andy snatched his bride from the hospital, where he landed after a head-on collision between his sports car and a telegraph pole in one of the more inaccessible parts of Wales. A young nurse, pink and white complexion, a sparkle in her eye, just like Claire when Paul first clapped eyes on her. Hey, standing for labour, this brother is with a big bridge down in the west. Well, that's it, turn up for dying, isn't it, no? Very well. Not in the least like the other wedding receptions. No three-tier cake, no wedding peel on cathedral bells, a Bethel Chapel schoolroom in a dead town, and tired lettuce salad served at trestle tables. But Paul Craddock felt at home somehow. At least these people had something in common with the valley. What was it? Celtic blood? A tacit alliance against privilege and the power of boardroom money? Simon noticed it. And Claire, too. Little taken aback by always egalitarianism after a quarter of a century as mistress of Shalliford House. But she played up, and Simon noticed this as well. Especially when he saw Stevie's elegant wife, Monica, wrinkle her nose over a bottle of lukewarm beer. No, thank you. I still have some sherry. It's labelled sherry at all events. You don't have to worry, Claire. If Monica doesn't adjust to the little Welsh girl, she'll have Stevie to reckon with. And I think she's already faced up to the fact. That's why she's trying so hard. <laughs> Dear Simon, there's not even privacy of thought when you're around, is there? The pair will never let money make snobs of them. How could they with you and the governor for parents? Oh, I can't take any credit for that. I was the worst kind of rural snob when I married your father. I dare say, but you respected him enough to learn from him. You taught each other tolerance. 
That's why your marriage has always been so spectacularly successful. <laughs> Stop it. You'll have me blushing in a minute. Blush away. If you can't flaunt a happy marriage like an ensign at a family wedding, when can you? <laughs> Oh, me too. Where's Rachel? Oh, wait. Why not come back with us for a few days? Hopeless. We've got a Whitson conference syllabus to get out and two dozen delegates to be briefed. Well, it's our silver wedding anniversary. We thought about having a party. Don't. Go away somewhere on your own. An occasion of that sort ought to be private and personal, especially in your case. <laughs> I think you're right, Simon. Anglesey? Now? Well, don't make it sound like Tibet. Your father and I spend our honeymoon in Anglesey. And Mary and I are to be packed off home like luggage? Exactly. Excess luggage. There's a train at 4.45. Change at Bristol. Well, honestly, it's a bit sick. Mary, they're going off up north on their own. You realise they'll giggle their heads off as soon as they put two and two together. And it was your idea, wasn't it? No, it was Simon's. Huh? You've just been congratulating me on the fact that we've got this far and are still using a double bed. Well, he said that. He implied it. <laughs> I don't think I ever realised he was such a romantic. Wasn't he? And wasn't she? Do the practical and pragmatic go hunting for a remembered magic in their comfortable middle age? We'll leave them alone, then, in Anglesey. In the same house where they spent their first honeymoon. A lively 53 and a spry 49, sharing the same satisfaction in each other. Someone hadn't weathered the years as well as the Craddocks, though, as they found out when they returned home. We uh, passed the station cab on the river road. Who called Mary? Mr. Grenfell. He's here now. I let him have Simon's old room. Uh, wait, Daddy. Uh, well? He's ill. He, he looked terrible. A Thursday seeing to him... I was right in asking him to stay, wasn't I? He was making for the Raven in Kumbe. Perfectly right, dear. You go up, Paul. I'll ring Maureen. Oh, Dr. Maureen's coming. I phoned her as soon as he was out of the way. Jimmy? Come in, Paul. I, uh, didn't intend staying when I heard you were away. I phoned through a week ago, the... Girl said you were all at the wedding. Yes. Uh, then uh, Claire and I went on to North Wales. Uh, what is it, Jimmy? Well, I've had to turn it in. I didn't tell you before because I wasn't certain. You'll have to find somebody else, Paul. Nonsense. Oh, a month or two down here and you'll be as good as new. Uh, Look, none of us could imagine anyone else representing us up there. Besides, you said yourself we might lose the seat if Labour made a three-cornered fight of it. We'll lose it anyway, Paul. The Tories have got a local man, a real local, not the counterfeit kind they've put up in the past. And who is it? Oh, son of a former tenant of yours, a young chap called Codsall. Co what? Sidney Codsall? You're joking. Oh, they've been grooming him since he made his presence felt on the county council. But he's the man behind everything that's shoddy around here. Uh, they, they can't know Sidney Codsall as I know him. And anyway, what the devil does he know about an agricultural constituency? They say he's made a pile. And you know how things are up there with all three major parties. It was Parliament when I first went there. Now, <laughs> it's a grand national with a tripwire at every jump. In a way, I'm glad to be done with it. And you've decided there's no real alternative to Tories and socialists, eh? Nothing's so dramatic. Uh, the last specialist I went to gave it to me straight. Cancer. I've got a year, maybe. And there's something I'd set my heart on finishing before I go. Now, don't waste time huffing and puffing. Claire knows already. But I made her promise to keep it to herself. No, they, they, they can do something for you, Jimmy. An operation. Who wants to die the death of a thousand cuts? No, Paul. I'm like a lot of your old cronies in the valley. I'd prefer to die on my feet. But I'm damned if I'll spend my last months watching clowns like Ramsay Mack and Stan Baldwin. Especially when I remember the real pros. Chaps like Asquith, Gray, Haldane, and even poor old Bonner Law. What will you do? Find a cheap place to rent. Finish my book on the Chartists. It's almost done. I've been working on it for years. 
Well, if that's your plan, you'll stay here in this house. Paul, uh, no, I... no, 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 don't let's have any argument about it. Claire would wish it, and Dr. Mooring will be handy. The place has been half empty since the boys left. That's not a sympathetic gesture, Paul. No, oh, it makes sense all round. Then I, I would like that. I'd like that very much. After all, it began in your library downstairs 30 years ago, that day I called uninvited, remember? And I'm not such a fool as to imagine I could have held the seat without you behind me. Oh, I've never had more than a flimsy majority made up of people who trusted me simply because they liked and trusted you. So Jimmy Grenville settled in and made a new convert, Mary Craddock. To capture the attention of someone your age is <laughs> the most flattering thing that can happen to an amateur historian. But your story of the Chartist isn't amateur. It's absolutely fascinating. It makes everything so much well, more relevant. Even the people around here. Your father, for instance? As a matter of fact, I was thinking of him. The conditions people had to work under. The way they were treated. It's not all that long ago. No. Why, Grandfather Derwent and old Aaron Stokes the Reed Cutter were still alive. It's all a bit... What? shaming, really. We've always teased Daddy for having a bee in his bonnet about the valley. But this book of yours makes it clear that well, there were always two kinds of people in charge. Yes. His sort, and landowners and employers there for what they could squeeze out of it. Tell him that sometime, my dear. It'll give him no end of a lift. She didn't tell him. She meant to, but before the book was proofed, before Jimmy Grenfell was carried into the parish churchyard, a change came over the atmosphere of the big house. And who could trace its source? Not Mary, who lived for dreams and letters in the post. And not Paul either, who knew the most intimate things about his tenants, but paid little attention to what was going on under his nose. Dr. Maureen could have enlightened them all, and ultimately was obliged to. But that was after Claire came to her, frozen-faced and wildly indignant. A baby? Me at my age? But it's ridiculous. It, it's impossible. It's a kind of freak miracle. Oh, of course it isn't. It's not at all that uncommon for someone who is exceptionally healthy and has already had a string of children. Once you've got over the shock, you'll be delighted. No. But for heaven's sake, when Paul realizes... I don't care what Paul thinks one way or the other. I hate the idea. I hate it, you understand? I thought we were done with all that. We'd be able to relax a bit and get about a bit more. But there's another reason. It, it's as though I'd been caught out in something embarrassing, a, a practical joke in bad taste that misfired. But you and Paul, I've always thought of you as people who gave their instincts a chance instead of delving into all those damn silly books on sex and psychology. You're not wrong about that. We've always found fun and pleasure in that side of marriage, but... Well, we don't have to proclaim it from the housetops, do we? The months that followed were a strange, difficult time for all of them. Dr. Maureen's advice to Paul was to be patient, that she'd certainly get over it as soon as the baby was born. He had enough on his mind anyway. He'd always been so personally involved with his friends in the valley that he couldn't refuse to go to Cornwall with Henry Pitts for his wife's funeral, even though it was only a week before the baby was due to be born. Didn't right. It didn't seem in I should lie down here on the other flaming Cornishman. There's a pet spainer. It belongs in the valley with the rest of us down her. Well, she was Truro born, and it was her own wish, Henry. Well, tis done now, and that's a biscuit on home. Look at the rain coming down, and all that moorland with naught but peat scrub and white slag heaps. No wonder I was caught her death of cold your boats. I was seedy when I set out, but I would go. As soon as her sister ran through and said her mother was dead. Well, at least you've got a son wanting to follow you at Hermitage, Henry. And that's more than I have. Us is all out of joint, master. And the time's along with us. Your boys are racketing round the country in eight cars. My girl Prudence married nigh on two year and no tacker showing up. Oh, by George, that reminds me. I'd better telephone from Budmin. Claire's baby is due in less than a week. Daddy, thank goodness you rang. Oh, why? Is anything wrong? Not wrong, but the baby's arrived early this morning. It's a boy, and they're both fine, Dr. Maureen says. Oh, 
Well, thank God. Look, I'm on my way back, Mary. Now, um, how's she taken it? It's hard to explain. She doesn't seem interested. Oh, just hurry along. She'll be all right when you're here. The fact is, Maureen, she still hardly looks at the kid. Oh, don't be cultivating another fancied grievance. Women are often withdrawn and unpredictable after childbirth. Do I go around looking for trouble? Yes. But your subconscious getting back at her for having your patience tried all the time she was carrying the boy. Uh, don't feed me any more of your psychological claptrap. You and John wouldn't have stood for it for a moment, and you know it. <laughs> uh, you and my John were two of a kind. Everything reduced to two-syllable words. But life isn't that simple, Paul. Suppose she'd screamed with triumph turned her back on you and gone goo-gooing over the new arrival. You would have been here now with an even bigger chip on your shoulder. How many times have you made love to the girl lately? The way things are, we seem to be heading for honorable retirement. Then you're both bigger fools than I took you for. Damn it, man, this is no more than a phase. You're both healthy and you're fond of one another. The years ahead of you could be the happiest yet. But it's for you to take the initiative. Well, I'd like to know how. Oh, think up some excuse to buy her something young and feminine. Take her out and about. The ball and beauty queen contest over at Paxtonbury, for instance. Well, I didn't mention that to her, but she was evasive, I thought. Buy her a new dress and dump her in the car. Heavens, why do I have to give advice to a man whose wife used to go weak at the knees when he entered a room? of the evening, oh, the county final of the contest to find this year's Devon Dairy Queen, who will go forward into the national competition to be held at the Majestic Hotel in London. John Rudd used to call it the Heifer Parade. I'd forgotten it was on the programme. Oh, sit back and hold on to your seat, Paul. Hmm? Ladies and gentlemen, here come the eight finalists representing Plymouth. <laughs> God, it's young Claire. Exeter. Whose idea was this? Why wasn't I consulted? Shout, Devon. She looks absolutely stunning, doesn't she? Oh, Lord, I hope she goes through. Of course she'll go through. There can't be any doubt about it. Unless the judges are blind. Or bribed. <laughs> Oh, it's a rotten thorn. I think you'd make a scene. Be scared for a minute. All the Craddocks turned up for the London finals, and half the rest of us as well. Stevie and the elegant Archdeacon's daughter, Andy and his little Welsh nurse, Simon and Rachel, taking time off from setting the world to rights. What do you think of her chances now, Paul? Mm, well, some of these finalists are in their early twenties, and she's just a kid. Oh, she's got to win. <laughs> well, why? She'll still be Devon's Dairy Queen for a year. Why is the national title so important? It's important to her. You see that, don't you, Monica? Oh, yes, I do. I was a Claire. Come again. The dim, pretty one in a brainy, spectacular family. Stevie and Andy make money. Simon and Mary read books people like me wouldn't open. We've won every riding trophy in the county, and young Claire just has her face and all the curves in the right place. It's jolly good luck to her. And the pity of it is it's expendable. A little of it goes every day after 20. Are you telling me that you would have liked this to happen to you? Oh, fervently. But I couldn't have carried it off with her aplomb. Oh, you could. But I'm damn sure your father would have walloped you all the way back to the valley if he'd caught you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in reverse order, third place in the contest for Britain's National Dairy Queen for the year 1935, Miss Cheshire. <laughs> Runner up, Miss Kent. <laughs> so, winner, ladies and oh, gentlemen. I think I'm going to be sick. Oh, no. Miss Devonshire. She's <laughs>
You're going back straight away, I hear, Governor. Oh, yes, Simon. The harvest is on us and everybody back there short-handed. Uh, Claire's staying to see the kid off on her Amsterdam trip. That's the first engagement, isn't it? The Rural Industries Fair. She flies out from Croydon tomorrow afternoon. Will you pop along and say goodbye to her now, Paul? We've got a fitting for dresses in half an hour. Uh, what time is your train? Uh, Mary and I are catching the ten o'clock. You'll be back tomorrow night, I suppose. I look out for you at the junction. Hurry and say goodbye to Claire. She's changing. Well, kiddo, you saw them off, didn't you? Hey, <laughs> and your mother and the boys and their wives are bursting with pride. I just popped it. Hey, you've been crying. Yes, I, I'm sorry, but I'm all right now. Well, what was it the excitement? I mean, you looked as cool as a cucumber. I thought you carried it off marvelously. Not excitement. I was frightened just for a minute. Oh, well, don't apologize for that. All that strain and all those yammering people. It... Now, look, you don't have to go through with this. It's only a kind of advertisement and you're not getting paid, just the expenses. Oh, I wasn't frightened of keeping my end up in public, Daddy. What, of going away? The first time on your own? No, not that either. Well, what then? Oh, it's hard to explain. Just... Well, the certainty of it, as though it was all bound to happen. You felt that as well? Hmm? Just for a minute. The first minute I was alone. Yes, it's a lot to ask a kid of your age. Hey, suppose I came to Holland with you. I'm sure it could be arranged. I could see the promoter. I wouldn't embarrass you. I'd just be there. No, Daddy. I started this on my own. I didn't even tell Mary I'd entered, and I'll go through with it. After all, it isn't just for the honour and glory or for all those dairymen, either. It's something for the valley. Something special, isn't it? <laughs> I think it is. They're all out there, crowing about how fine you looked. <laughs> but right now, I'm admiring something else. You've got guts, kiddo. A lot more than I'd show in your present circumstances. Oh, you'd look like hell under a crown and ermine, Daddy. <laughs> Okay, now, eh? Okay. Ah, then jolly good luck, kid. Daddy. Hmm? Daddy, I don't really take everything for granted. I'm not very good at saying thank you, but... Oh, thank you for being so sporting about this and... Well, for everything, right back as far as I can remember. So, he left her to find her own destiny. The way all of them have been now... Except Mary. And Mary had rumbled letters from Queensland, Vancouver, and heaven knows where. She had plenty to tell him, too. And cuttings to send after the Dairy Queen contest. This one doesn't do Claire justice. It was one of those awful flashlight pictures. She looked startled. The one of... Claire by herself is better. This is the national program. Here is the second general news bulletin, copyright reserve. There are believed to be no survivors from this afternoon air disaster involving the British dairymen's contingent on their way to the Rural Industries Fair in Amsterdam. Among those on board was the recently chosen British dairy queen, 17-year-old Miss Claire Craddock of Shallowford, Devon. Traces of the fuselage have been located three miles off the Dutch coast, but so far no bodies of passengers or crew have been recovered. Claire! Oh, God! Claire! Don't answer it, Thursa! I'll go! Shallowfoot House? Is Mr. Craddock there? No, uh, no, he, he's out. He's gone to meet Mrs. Craddock's train. Is that Miss Mary Craddock? Yes. The one with police here. This is Sergeant Beeworthy, miss. It, it's, it's about the air crash. My, my sister, Claire. Ah, you heard about it? Just now on, on, on the wireless. Listen, Sergeant, I, I'd much sooner you left this to me. Mummy won't have heard she'll have been travelling, and Daddy won't know either. It won't be in the local evening paper yet. You'd prefer 
prefer to bring it to me yourself. I must. To both of them, uh, as soon as they get back. Very well, Miss Cunning. I could come over later, as soon as more information comes in. There's no hope? None at all? I'm afraid not, Miss. London said there were no survivors. I could help in one way. Mm -hmm. Suppose I get the local exchange to filter a call through to the station. It won't be long before the press are onto you. Please do that. I, I, I'd be most Thank grateful. You, Miss Mary. Remember? <laughs> uh, over again, eh? Your friend is a bit quiet after all that. Oh, you should have seen all those journalists what? at the airport. In the newspapers, <laughs> was it? <laughs> Hello, Mary. What are you looking so glum about? What is it, dear? <laughs> You're upset. Some, something's happened. What, something here? No. Something awful. Uh, about Rumble, Mary? No. About Claire. Oh, she, she's ill. Has, has somebody telephoned? There's, there's been an accident. An awful accident. But where? Flying. Oh, God. It, it was on the wireless. And then the... Police rang. Is there no hope, Mary? None at all? No. Take a drink, Paul. <laughs> Claire. It won't help me, but it will help you. Here. Drink it. Look after him, Mary. I'm going upstairs for a moment. Oh, something else. I'll never forget you making yourself tell us. Never. Remember that, dear. Thurza. Yes, Mrs. Crudup? I'm going into the baby. Go down the drive and fetch the lady doctor. Tell her Mr. Craddock needs her urgently. Hurry. Uh, yes, sir. Say hello to your father. Oh, I wonder why I always thought you were an ugly little beggar. <laughs> a funeral without a corpse. That was something new in the valley. And so was a stricken look in Paul's face, on the faces of everyone up at the big house especially the face of Mary Craddock. Until one seeping autumn afternoon, when she was poking among the waist-high nettles in the kitchen yard of the abandoned periwinkle. Who's there? Come on out. This is private property. Private, my eye. Rumble! <laughs> oh, Rumble, Patrick! Oh, Rumble, darling! Hey there, easy now, easy. <laughs> Now, who's been talking? Who sent you snooping here within half an hour of me jumping the train at Sorrel Holt? No one. I, I didn't know. Didn't dream. Oh, Rumble, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to have you back. Well, I'm not quarreling with the demonstration. My, you're pretty. It's good to be back. Oh. Oh. Hey, you've lost weight, though. You couldn't be more than a hundred pounds. Oh, put me down. <laughs> Suppose anyone comes down the river road. I'll put you down as soon as I've carried you over the threshold. This threshold? Oh, why not? It's crummy right now, but there's nothing here I couldn't fix myself by the time we're married. Married? <laughs> oh! Oh, good heavens. You haven't even proposed. All those letters about silent sheep dip 
Edgar Yields. Oh, you'd be tickled if you knew how many trial drafts lie in waste paper baskets all over B.C. and Alberta. Oh. Well, uh, how are they at home? Oh. How's your mother taken it? A lot better than father. We've all been clinging to her ever since it happened. Oh, but mm. you showing up is just what Daddy needed. I read him all your letters. What? <laughs> Parts of them. <laughs> He approves of you enormously. Well, that's one hurdle behind me. You want to buy Periwinkle, but good heavens, boy. Most of it's reverted to moorland and the farmhouses are shambles. Uh, well, I, I can get the original fields back from Hermitage and Four Winds, of course, and patch up the buildings, but why not begin on something a little less back-breaking? You... Yeah. You could even get a farm on the Heronsley Estate across the river. There there are two that are tenantless, I'm told. No, I wouldn't care to go outside the valley. And if I farm, I farm as a freeholder. How about 20 pounds an acre if I do the repairs myself? But you are merry, oh, my dear chap. You can have Periwinkle for a song. No handouts, sir. You know me. All right, I'll talk to Henry Pitts and Harold Evely, and we'll draw up some kind of agreement. It was an old-fashioned wedding, by current Craddock standards, with very few foreigners, as Henry Pitts was delighted to note. Well, will I do? You look marvellous, absolutely marvellous. Oh, how long? Oh, any minute. Uh, look, can I get you a dram before the cab arrives? Do I look as if I need one? <laughs> no, you don't. You look like a rather smug swan. Then I'll get you one. <laughs> Come to that, Daddy. You look pretty smug yourself. Oh, well, why not? This is something special for me. All those other weddings were... Well, maybe I shouldn't say it, but they were occasions. Now, you and Rumble represent continuity. Something I've worked for, hoped for all my life. Yes, you uh, wouldn't remember Rumble first coming here, would you? It's one of the first things I do remember. Oh, but you were only six. I remember Mother calling us all together and telling us that Rumble's mother was dead and his father was away at the war. And we were to make it up to him. I was the only one impressed. <laughs> well, that makes it full circle. Now he's taking charge of you. Well, here goes the last of the Craddocks. You don't have to sound so beastly relieved about it. <laughs> I might be the shrinking violet of the family, but I have had chances. Yes, you have. But I'm damn glad you didn't take them. There was one bloody old foreigner at the wedding. We knew all about him, but he didn't appear among us that often. Fran Zorndorf, king of a thousand scrapyards, including the original one that paid Squire Craddock's footing down here. Franz was still as slick and dapper and knowing as an old tomcat raised on crane. That was an odd relationship. He and Paul had been bickering 40 years and were at it again as the old rascal was handed into his Rolls Royce in the forecourt the day after the wedding. You won't change your mind, Uncle Franz. You won't stay on a few days. Not a matter of one, but car. Ah, oh, rubbish. You're a millionaire and by my reckoning, 85 plus. Whoa. What the hell is the sense of dragging yourself back to that madhouse when you could stay here and breathe unpolluted air? Paul's right. There can't be any point in making more money at your age. There's a point in safeguarding what I have made. I recently returned from the continent. I went down to Vienna. And to get there, I was fool enough to cross Germany. Fool enough? <laughs> what am I saying? Wise enough, maybe. I had my suspicions, mind you, but seeing is believing. You have heard of Hitler, I imagine. Are you trying to tell me you take that master race line seriously? I saw something in Munich that frightened me more than that touched like rallies and goat stepping. A cardboard tank? No, boy. Elderly women scrubbing the streets of the Jewish quarter and kept at it by arrogant young thugs wielding dog whips. I've lived a very long time and seen a great deal. I can't read small print without spectacles, but I don't need them to recognize vultures when I see them. I'll give you some advice, Paul. The last you'll ever get from me. Buy pedigree stock and the latest machinery. Buy land, buy seed, buy fertilizer. I'll build a reservoir in one of those paddocks for fuel. That'll be the first thing rationed. 
and ignore everything you read in the newspapers about pacts and non-aggressive treaties and about Germany being too poor to wage war. Adolf Hitler is in a competitive business. In that sphere, there's only one rule. Get on or get out. <sighs> right away. Drive, Brixen. My appointment is for seven, sharp. It's Rachel, Paul. She's walked all the way from Coombe Bay, the silly girl. It didn't occur to me to phone. I'm not thinking logically these days. Where's Simon Hill? He was well enough when I last saw him. Well? well you've split up. Not in that way. We've had a big row, though. The biggest we've ever had. What about? Spain. Spain? He's going there to fight. He's at Falmouth now, waiting for transport. Oh, what the devil made him do a crazy thing like that? He thinks it's important. Oh, you know the line. Solidarity of the left. The dictators using Spain as a dress rehearsal. Well, what did you imagine we could do, Rachel? I suppose I had some hope you might try and stop him before it's too late. Well, if you couldn't, how can I? He thinks of me as an 18th century anachronism. He's got a very great affection for you, nevertheless. Both of you. When does he expect to sail? Any day. They'll go by coaster to Bordeaux, then foot it over the Pyrenees. You think he would let Paul talk him out of going? Simon! Simon! Simon, for God's sake, boy. Come ashore. Come home. It's not your quarrel, is it? Rachel sent you? She's distraught, and I don't blame her. She oughtn't to have involved you. I'm 32, Governor. Oh, don't think I'm not on your side. I hope to God those chaps give Franco a hammering. But it isn't our concern, or Russia's or Germany's. They've got to solve their own problems the way we did 300 years ago. Oh, damn it, boy. Your wife is a militant socialist, and it, her view is that you'll do far more good organizing public opinion. Fight if you must, but on the hustings right here. It's too late for the hustings, Governor. In Germany, Italy, and Spain, they've all been relegated to museums. Well, will you change that by bleeding to death in a Spanish ditch? I doubt it. But I've still got to live with myself for the next 40 years. Look, will you write? Will you promise to keep in touch? Yes, I'll do that. And I appreciate your coming all this way to... to wish me luck. Oh, there's one other thing. It, well? It'll sound pretty sloppy. You don't have to apologize for sentiment to me. No. Have you got a photograph of my mother you could send on? I've got several. I'll pick out the best of them. Well, the World War worked the militancy out of her system. Maybe it'll do the same for you. Maybe. I'll be satisfied to help localize it. So long, Gov, and thanks again for trying. Then good luck, son. Good luck and God bless. Shallowfoot House. Andy here, Mater. Andy! It's the gunabout. I'll fetch him, Andy. Where are you speaking from? Paris. Paris? Uh, Paul, it's Andy phoning from Paris. Is anything the matter? Is Stevie with you? Stevie's right here. Put the gov on the line. Hello, Andy. We've got news of Simon. Yes? He's a prisoner in Valencia. Oh, good God. Look, uh, how, how the devil did you get Never to know? Mind, huh? These crappy old boys have got ways and means. We work together. When you asked us to trace him, we did it from here. The fact is, Gov, he was in a spot. They had to pull God knows how many strings to make contact and then stop him being backed against a wall. But you've done it? Yes, we've done it. They're turning him loose. He'll be arriving at Tilbury on Thursday. Well, you're running down to us straight away. It might be a good idea for you to drive up and fetch him, Gov. By all accounts, you'll need watching for a bit. Well, he's wounded? No, but he's down to just over seven stone. But it's not just that. Uncle Francis solicitors want to see you. His will is being proved. Oh, I had nothing to do with his business. No, he's left that to us. But you're involved, Governor, quite a lot. The bulk of his money goes to Zionism, but there's ten thousand pounds for you, too. Ten thousand? Go, Gov. Stevie and me will be flying back tonight. Shall we say Wednesday at my place? All the news then. You heard all that? Most of it. Oh, those two boys, the world they live in. How do they go about doing what they've done for Simon? I mean, what's the link between old iron and a condemned cell in Spain? Uh, it's no good asking me that old girl. I'll take it on trust that there is one and be damn grateful for it. Here, yeah. what did Simon weigh when he left here? Well, Thirteen stone, odd. Yes. 
Well, he's leaving half of himself there, wounded or unwounded. In someone else's quarrel. Oh, no. No, it's our quarrel now. Simon was right. He was the only one, apart from old France, who had it right from the beginning. And France is dead. That makes us a minority of two. Three? But you? I've always accepted the fact that you knew what you were doing where the valley was concerned. I had the impression you looked on my siege preparations the way everyone else about here regarded them. Show me the woman with grown sons who'll admit, even to herself, that they'll be called upon to face what we faced 20 years ago. Oh, no, Paul. You don't bring it into the open. You go on telling yourself it's a bad dream. That's what I've been doing ever since Simon went off to that war. You should have told me that before. It would have helped me through this last year or two. Well, you won't go again. I couldn't face up to that, no matter what. <laughs> well, at 59, have a heart. Oh, there'll be plenty to do right here. Well, I'll get a few things together for the trip and then drive over to Rumbles and tell Rachel Simon is safe and on his way home. Stop here, Governor. Let me look at it. Let me take it in. It never had much for you in the past, Simon. It has now. Over there, I thought of it often. It's worth fighting for. I had never any doubt about that. Well, Simon, will we win through when the chips are down? We always have. Providing we wake up in time. It won't be my fault if we don't. Hey, you'll get some rest and put on weight before you dive back into the deep end. Oh, yes, I'll do that. But I'm not cured, Governor. I don't regret a day of it. I've satisfied myself I'm on the right track. As I told Claire, that makes two of us. And all the others? Oh, I'm not despairing. Well, not yet. All they need is a jolt. They got their jolt. Mr. Chamberlain's piece of paper and proof of what it was worth six months later. Their faith in Paul's judgment and steadfastness came into the open at first light on June 1st, 1939, the morning of his 60th birthday. Claire heard the scuffling in the laurel beyond the forecourt and looking out, watched him for a moment or so before waking him. What? Who? What, what time is it? Coming up to six and you've got visitors. <sighs> a baker's dozen of them, scuffling under the window and all looking a little sheepish. I came close to making a lady could dive a bow to them. Hi there, Henry, smart! What's up? What's the trouble? No trouble, master! Trot him out, smart, and let the gentleman see the rabbit. <laughs> it's old Snowdrop's ghost. With the compliments of everyone between the main road and the bluff. What? It's, it's for me. <laughs> Who else? But he's magnificent. <laughs> Why, a horse like that would carry me all day. And get some of your excess weight off. <laughs> go and put on your dressing gown and go down and say thank you, like a good boy. The best birthday present he ever had. That grey became as familiar in the valley as old Snowdrop had been for so many years. Another birthday came round. Sometimes at 60 plus, a birthday can pass unnoticed. Does a man reckon his age when called upon to play soldiers in the sand hills all night? To watch seven miles of coast with nine men, three boys, four shotguns and a rook rifle. Pondering last night's news that his twin sons were learning to fly. Or last week's news that Sergeant Simon Craddock was not numbered among the Dunkirk survivors. Number one observation post. Halt! Who goes there? Oh, friend and father-in-law. Class, friend and father-in-law. Nothing stirring. Two Blenheims flying inland at 0400 hours. Otherwise, not a sausage. Mark Cotswell will leave you in five minutes. Go home to Mary and get your breakfast. Very good, sir. It's not that much of a joke up all night at my time of life. Oh, stick it, Grandpa. Grandpa? <laughs> well, if Mary hasn't spilled the beans, I will. She's going into production. Look out for the first credit dividend around Christmas. Oh, God bless me so. Hey, don't say what I said. It's about time. Paul, you've missed him by five minutes. He missed who, old girl? Simon. Simon? What, he's safe? He, he got away? From St. Marlowe. He just rang through from Folkestone. And Paul, he swam for it. Swam for it? What, swam the channel? 
Well, a bit of it, of about a mile. And then he was picked up by a destroyer. Oh, he sounded cock a hoop. Why, he deserves to be. Swam for it, by God. What? He's indestructible. Damn it, we're all indestructible. <laughs> uh, yes, and I know why you're looking cock a hoop, too. You taught him to swim. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll have breakfast before you go up. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, ten minutes ago, I hadn't an appetite, Bob. I've got one now. I'm glad. A man should never miss breakfast on his birthday. Birthday? <laughs> so you had forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had. Yeah, all right, I've got news that'll make you sit up. Mare is expecting. Now, oh, around Christmas, you're almost a grandmother. <laughs> ah. I wondered when they'd get around to telling us. Oh, God, I might have known... You know, one of these days I'll catch you bending. But today seems to be my turn. Oh, go on, open it. Hmm? The long, ungainly parcel beside your plate. It was fiendishly difficult to buy and even harder to wrap. It's, it's a rifle! A deer rifle! A repeater! Why, this is lethal at 500 yards. How the devil did you come by a thing like this these days? Don't ask. I bent several laws, and smart as my agent bent others. <sighs> However, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall never surrender. So when the police call, have it pat. Oh, it's magnificent. Oh, perfect balancing. Huh? Oh, this makes sense of an LDV patrol and the suspension of home comforts. <laughs> all right, then. Let them come. Let them all come. <laughs> I'll tear a few gaps in their bloody ranks before they chase me out of the valley. June 1940, and the heat haze shimmering over the sorrel water meadows by 8 a.m. That means another scorcher. It always did. It always will. What does the poet say? Title and profit I resign. The post of honor shall be mine. In Post of Honor... Paul Craddock was played by William Lucas, Claire by Josephine Tewson, Simon and the Twins by Christopher Bidmead, Douglas Hankin and Anthony Jackson, Mary by Rosalind Shanks, Wiz and Young Claire by Carol Marsh, and Rumble by Leroy Lingwood. Wilfred Babbage was the shallow Fordian, Rolf Lefevre and Eileen Canale played John and Mary Rudd, and Rachel Evely and Eleanor Codsell were played by Beth Boyd and Margaret Robertson. Franz Zorndorf by Geoffrey Winkert, Edward and Hugh Derwent by Harold Caskett and Alexander John, James Grenfell and Henry Pitts by Preston Lockwood and Anthony Vickers. Harold and Connie Evely were played by Nigel Anthony and Hilda Schroeder, and Monica by Gudrun Ewer. This play, the last of three, based on R.F. Delderfield's novel, A Horseman Riding By, was produced by Guy Vazen.